Manuela, uh, our discussant. Manuela Boyagiev is professor at the Institute for Sociology and Cultural Organization at Leifana University of Lunenburg and a member of the Berlin Institute for Integration and Migration Research at Humboldt University, Berlin. She specializes in migration and racism in Europe and cultural theory. Her major publications include a monograph on theories of racism and the history of migrants' practices of resistance. And she co-edited volumes on the transformation of the European Union migration regime in Southeast Europe, critical accounts of Europeanization, labor, migration, and logistics, as well as a handbook on theory of racism in Germany. Thank you, Manuela. I'll give you the floor. No. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Very good. Um, thank you, Rita, for this uh, introduction. Thank you very much um, to Raffaella Laudani, uh, Rosie Bredotti, and Judith Butler for inviting me. It's a real privilege to be here in the double sense. It's a privilege that we take the time to discuss these issues, and it's a privilege and honor in this sense for me to be here. Okay, um, uh, I would also like to extend my thanks to um, Stefano and Tiziana who have sent their papers uh, to me and I had the pleasure to read them and, uh, and they were very inspiring. And I'll try to uh, yeah, comment on this, but before I do so, um, I would like to make some more general remarks that help me to sort of uh, enter this encounter uh, by thinking how you know, I would approach the question of, um, you know, the critical task of the university today. Okay, uh, let me begin by a very simple remark, and this is that for me personally, um, having studied at uh, Frankfurt University's beginning in the early 90s, and um, after the unification of the two German states, um, there was always two, um, two influences, and this was, uh, of course, um, um, theory, social theory, and uh, critical theory, but also a, um, an influence of praxis. So, to some extent, the refugee and anti-racist movement of that time became something like a classroom for me. Hence, um, the university, as we today begin, and this is how uh, this has been communicated, um, this encounter has been communicated, to defend um, as a valued site for critical thinking and public life, has always been, for me, a paradoxical side, um, and I assume for many others in this room, too. In my view, there are three dimensions in which this problematic of thinking in, through, and beyond the institution has been with us, many of which we have already been mentioning in the last couple of days. Each of them affects each other respectively, contributing to the potentials of our critical thinking and its impact um, and its impact on different levels. And I also think that all of them need to be revisited in order to respond to what the critical task of the university today may be. Firstly, I think of the ability to produce and develop critical ways of thinking. While we were always occupied with what it means to be critical, from Kant to Foucault to Judith Butler, we also inquired as to how we can push the limits of our critique to increase its impact. We have asked who performs critique, um, so for example in the distinction of Foucault, the universal or the organic intellectual, which has also been named by Sandro before, what subjectivities arise from it, and if you think of the subjectivities that we find at, in the current academic or contemporary academic life, I'm actually bothered about this. How critique can be heard, and we try to understand why it went unheard, and what narratives we deem critical. In short, how we conceive of the relation between the praxis of critique and the critique of praxis. Secondly, on a more historical, empirical level, thinking and doing research within the tradition of one particular discipline has always been an object of critique, and thus we found ourselves in a reconceptualization of this institution, and more and more people from different perspectives and with different aims, I think, are thinking about um, interdis interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary ways of education and research. Or, for those whose work takes place in one specific institution, the tradition of radical education as developed 
for example, by Paulo Freire, and I think this name has to be mentioned on an account like this, and it hasn't been so far, and many other cautions us that the university environment may not always be the right place to listen to whom and what we need to listen to for our critical practices. The same is true for, uh, to the impressive organizational efforts of the freedom schools of the US civil rights movement or any other effort to organize people's universities, both of which positioned knowledge production and teaching outside of the teaching machine. Thirdly, and I think you have been referring to this, uh, Tiziana, in your final remarks about, you know, the question of how act in activism there already is knowledge production. I think there's a very long um, tradition of this. Thirdly, this is a more structural argument. The political economic conditions of our critique have always been part of our understanding of what we do, what we can do, and where we perform this work. Be it more general analysis of capitalism, the blurring distinction between manual and intellectual labor, or a very concrete one like studying political economy of the university, whether at a private or a public institution framed by a national or a national social state. Here we find different limits and potentials of our work, quite different from the intellectual capacities or restrictions of the discipline and the institution. It is along these lines of these three dimensions, and maybe there are more, that I believe we need to revisit the critical task of the university. Okay, now let me turn to Stefano's and Tiziana's paper, uh, which I called as a working title, Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> It is this last dimension, the political economy, and maybe um, also the historical empirical um, um, questions or dimensions that Tiziana has referred to, um, that I think the papers of Tiziana and Stefano mainly res respond to. In my understanding, what you are saying is, in very simple words, naivety is inappropriate. And what you are thinking through is the question have the abilities and the limits to critique reached a new quality so that it has become unavoidable to develop new ways, forms and practices of resistance and desires in times of new temporal spatial compression that um, at, our, at the university that we face. So I think this temporal spatial compression is what we talked about yesterday when we talked, for example, about the global south or the acceleration question um, that you have um, asked. So there are these two productive paradoxes in the two papers that my comment will exploit in order to propose a discussion. And there are probably many more that you can raise. You both help us think through the algorithmically organized structure of logistics that have become part of our quotidian lives as academics and more so our labor and to what extent this apparatus of logistics and algorithms has begun to work on us, make use and profit from us and our thinking and in doing so how it treats us as we have become both habituated to and inhabitants of the logistical machine, as Wendy Chan puts it, or as if we were a part which has no part, to borrow a phrase from Jacques Rancière. But you both also identify structural limits to this machine, which seems to lie firstly in the self-destructive effects of the machine, as well as, secondly, in the uncommensurable, the irrepressible part of it that is living labor. That logistic has become the government of movement, as Stefano shows, is probably as much of a scarifying experience as any of the movements we experience, we experience detached from its movements, an experience which goes back to the time since movement and mechanization became historically linked. We could refer to this point in time retrospectively, retrospectively and perhaps somewhat ironically as industrialization 1.0, relating it to the invention of the self-propelled steam machine. It must have been around the time of industrialization that the machine which was created to move by itself 
was used for utilitarian purposes and for production. It was at the same time that a knowledge of the body as a mechanical machine prospered too. The body, and particularly the laboring body, as Marx and Engels remind us in the Communist Manifesto, became a production machine that was now made to move by itself, an organic automata. This development was later termed, termed Taylorism or scientific management, depending on you know, the strand that you are. Taylorism was a more critical, scientific management was a less critical term. Stefano and Tiziana vividly demonstrate that we live in time in which the relationship between science and management has been reversed. And while science continues to serve the management of labor, now operative through what Ned Rossiter calls logistical media, management has also, and more than ever, taken control of science. But, as Stefano shows in his survey of histor historical business literature, it is not just management as such, but rather logistical management, in which movement is even further abstracted from its context and its agency. The times of digital tailorism have arrived, in which, through algorithmic management, the laboring body is further fragmented, abstracted, standardized, and optimized. Tiziana and Stefano are working out the paradox that we all fe feel has entered the real arm of our non-manual labor time, a growing paradox in which human technology becomes more lifelike in the form of, for example, robots, drones, or artificial intelligence, while our life, in effect, and our thinking is treated as raw material to be engineered. Or, as Pramesh Lalu called it yesterday, the proletarization of ac academic labor. This engineering approach to living matter is what makes our present uncanny and forces us to expand the reach and scale of our critique. Here, both of you speak of the self-destructive forces we are able to observe with algorithmic governance. Although Stefano sees the, the acting out on a different level at the level of capitalism as such, and I think you agree as well, Tiziana seems to be more cautious in her estimation of the reach that this self-destruction may have and points to the level of the decreasing quality of our work in the paper <laughs> and that it may become self-destructive because, as both of you argue, the quality of our work is essential not only to our own critical praxis, but to the regeneration of capitalism itself. When we look at logistics or the development of the blockchain, for example, as a decentralized governing entity of itself, in many ways we are building on a long tradition of the amalgamation of living and non-living labor to the production of a task, a living being pulling or being pulled by a non-living Apparatus. Thus, we are following as well as diverting from a long tradition of the use of different forms of labor for productive tasks, as Stefano has referred to when speaking about slavery. So from the human, the slave, the indentured labor, and also reproductive labor to other animals and machines. Logistic further abstracts life being used for mechanical tasks. At the same time, we are also unsettling the concept of machine by reintroducing elements of agency and imperfectibility, as Andrew's talk yesterday showed, showed that characterize all living matter into it. While logistics as the governance of algorithm can create an artificial movement that goes against individual agency, you too problematize the relations between movement and vitality by referring to the concept of living labor. Encountering the human attempt to control and fully instrumentalize life, we are relieved that in both your papers, although you emphasize the futilities of full control over life and labor, you also insist on life's ongoing defiance. The machine gets interrupted by social disruptions like the proposed general strike against the algorithm and we may add as well by technical failure or political dysfunction.
Nevertheless, I would advise us to think of the narrative structure that we give to this story and would caution us to think of logistics and the way the algorithm has organized our lives, not as a totality or a paralogistic that governs us in total. But then, how do we tell the story? Logistics seems to challenge us to see it everywhere. After spending several years, also with Sandro and other colleagues, working on the relationship between logistics and migration, so this very particular movement across the globe, we began to doubt its paralogistical character. The counter-narrative in both your paper arises out and off against this totality, but how does it exist in our lives as we live them? Can we take over the algorithm? What about its built environment, its lived social relations, its regulatory institution, or its property definition when we, for, for example, take into account that they, the, these uh, algorithms and these systems are uh, the property of SAP or IBM or other com companies? How can they be changed? I am actually convinced that our aliveness, if I may call it that, can be found everywhere and ultimately for everyone. Which leads me to pose the following question. Do we not have the obligation to find aliveness in each grain of our ecological existence? And if so, where do you both see it? With regard to my second point that I will make sure, Short, clearly, Stefano, and you may object to this characterization, we, we refer to a second contradiction in which I, am also, in which I am also very interested in. It is also, albeit related, a, to a point made by Wang Wei in the discussion after the first panel. He asked, is the algorithmic censorship depoliticized censorship? And I would add, on the basis of what concept of the political? You argue that logistics, so Stefan again, is deeply entangled in the hegemonic social constructions of what Etienne Balibar has called in his new book, Citizen Subject, the anthropological differences of species, gender, race, and their respective relations to labor. You also seem to argue that in most cases, these same logistics contain social constructions inbuilt within and into the developments of these technologies, their interpretations and their applications. I would, I would like to hear more about that from you. But I also have an example that may you know, help um, think through this. Uh, the repressive force of this, um, of, this, of this way to sort of reorganize these constructions within the algorithmic organization uh, may be captured by a term that seems useful um, and that, um, that can be used to, ha to, to track our actions across the World Wide Web. In a paper published by John Cheney Lippold, he provocatively distinguishes citizenship as we know it, either based on eus sanguinis or eus solis, from a newly emerging form of citizenship, the eus algorithmi. As John Briddle, who makes use of this in an interesting artwork, writes, it describes a new form of citizenship that is produced by the surveillance state, whose primary mode of operation, like other state forms before it, is controlled through identification and cate categorization. Use algorithmi, the right of the algorithm, refers to the increasing use of a software to make judgment about an individual's citizenship status and thus to decide what rights he or she has and what operation on his or her person are permitted. The use algorithmi strikes me as a particular useful when commenting on your papers and the connection between logistics and the way in which our academic lives have been governed by algorithms. If taken as such, the tendency is that the subject subjective parts, the knowledge and the effective dimensions are exploited without equipping academic labor with competi com competent compet competencies, sorry, this is difficult for me to pronounce, Compe competencies? You got it, thank you. <laughs> that have historically been associated with intellectual labor. Uh, 
operation of the academic institution, decisions over production, its organization and products. The process of production, what is produced and how, with whom, to which extent, with which technical means, in which part of the world, all of this gets beyond the purview of academic labor and remains in the hands of even more powerful businesses that merely coordinate lower level academic work. Even the organizational parts are being outsourced by a decentralized network power. And so the idea of citizenship moves less in direction of demands of equality, as we have discussed them for a long time, but more on the tendency on the grounds of equivalence and measure. The other side of the paradox, though, however, seems to refer to the potential this machine unleashes. Are we not also observing, and admittedly, this is very, a very unpopular argument that also Sandro has made, that at the same time that we are being identified, categorized, and controlled, new groups of people are entering the university, new knowledge is flowing in, and old structures are breaking away, which had secured the corporate principle of the old call them Global North Universities, longingly rep reproducing its kind for so long. Moreover, in your papers you suggest that logistics may offer an opportunity to break free from these circumstances at the same time, particularly because logistics tries to be stripped from social constructions that prohibit the flow which is essential to it. As such, can it serve as the operating grounds and point of possible departure and escape from socially human-centric ingrained discourses and hurdles that logistics, as we as well, need to overcome to actually make the flow flow? Is there counter-logistics? Theoretically speaking, the logistical machine, while making use of it, activating and reproducing those anthropological differences, makes a difference. It does not so much foreground those differences as such, but in fact foregrounds the relational quality of those anthropological differences by serving as the relational per machine per se, and therefore pushes them to their limits as self-contained entities executed by the state, identity, and so on, and opening up them up to contestation, questioning, and dialogue. In my understanding, social cooperation, the sociability of active relation, remains a central productive force to push this task against privatization and control. Let me make one last remark. The desire to go beyond what we already think and do, how this is already limited by the political, economic, and social conditions in which we develop critical thinking, and to whom we speak, or with whom we do research, and where we go to learn and teach, all of these components result in what kind of commitment we feel obliged to have, who and what we re respond to, what our teaching and learning can affect, how we think of ourselves as teachers, and where the classroom is in which we listen to each other, and lastly, what narratives we select to tell the story and persuade us and others of how things could be or could be different. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Manuela, for your deep response to the talks. Uh, and uh, I think there are a lot of elements we want to discuss and to share. So I give floor to, to you. And uh, oh, Stefan, you are here. I've lost you. It's a very mobile session. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the two speakers and the respondent. Um, my question is, uh, in certain sense, about the sort of hist the history that both of the speakers um, build on in order to um, offer thoughts about the present context. Uh, Stefano's discussion of making uh, work flow or making flow work, and the importance of quality control. Uh, within that, and Tiziana's point about uh, the way in which the university was at one point, or could be understood within a history of welfare 
institutions. I think one of the potential problems of Stefano of connecting the university to the factory and the shop and the office is that it elides, or brackets, an important history. For instance, one could talk about um, a history of the ways in which um, home economics, for instance, develops at the universities in the 19th century for training a worker, primarily a female worker, at home. Um, and the ways in which uh, Christina Frederick, for instance, who was working to popularize sciences of productivity at home, but also was publishing in Ladies' Home Journal, right? So the point that I want to make with that reference is that in the 21st century, uh, and there is a longer history of pedagogies outside of the university, that are about shaping and training workers, citizens, etc. One could easily, and people have talked about reality TV, uh, much of YouTube, for instance, and there is a whole regime of financial uh, training of a kind of entrepreneur in the 21st century. And I think that in some respects, sort of focusing on the university as a site for creating, for training, for shaping a kind of quality control or using platforms as a teacher at the university as a, for, as a technology of management elides the ways in which the 21st century university, the knowledge economy, the so-called creative economy, et cetera, is predicated by these competing, one could say, technologies of pedagogy, of training, et cetera. And my punchline to all of this is that this is where the historical contradiction and legacy of Trump University uh, comes from, right? As a regime of reality TV, of, of, of multimedia franchising, that included in part a whole set of books about being a good entrepreneur, uh, a university, et cetera. But I think it's important for those of us who are trying in some ways to understand either a post-university or whether or not reality TV or YouTube instruction offers a kind of new form of welfare in the 21st century uh, are important questions to ask that weren't posed as directly in your presentations. Thanks. Thank you. Andrew. This was, this was a wonderful panel. Uh, I have a, a, a particular question for Tatiana, was, um, all of whose work I'm going to read today. Because um, I was very inspired by your, the way in which you adapted the, um, the new forms of Marxist sociology and economics of education to this vision of the post-university. Could you say more about the post in the post-university? Um, we continue speaking of it as a, the university as a site. But one of the things that the uh, capacities of the new media that you're describing is to make the very notion of the university as a site problematic, but in a productive way, in a way that is for the commons as opposed to for the corporations. But I'd love to hear a little bit more about the post. Yeah. First. Th Yes, I wanted to make two points. One regarding something we were discussing yesterday too, which was strange to me, but um, it relates to the difference or not difference here between 
thinking the structure of university as an institution and the problem of humanities. I think it has been like a bit blurred, this difference, and I think we should stress that it is not the same. I, I understand that the two problems are mixed up. In my country, they are also mixed up. I understand that, but to think of a university as an institution involves many other problems, uh, as to think of the state as a complex institution involves other problems than thinking. Uh, we cannot say identify the two problems. That's what I'm saying. Related to that, I hear that uh, I think you have called the educational system as a machine. Well, on that point, I would say that, okay, but it is not only a machine. I, I mean, I, I would say that if you think of university as a complex institution, then it is not only a machine, it is, or it is a complex machine, the, anyway. The second point I, I wanted to raise is about um, the idea of that uh, society of knowledge blurs the difference uh, between manual and intellectual labor. Well, I understand why you say that, but I think worldwide there is still a very evident division of labor. And uh, I would say that for us, it is absolutely fundamental not to lose the uh, strength that critical concept of the division of labor makes. Because if we do, our actual president is asking Argentina to be again in his class, its classical function of being a provider. Uh, uh, so. We, can, we, we are in the manual side of the division of labor. And, well. There was another question, then I think we, it's better if we, they answer. Do you have the microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so very briefly, I'll try. Um, so I liked both of uh, all three of the uh, statements and ideas proposed, um, and I was just trying to think how we can connect both. Can I ask you please to speak a bit louder because it's <laughs> difficult? No, I don't want to say that. <laughs> okay, um, right. <laughs> uh, I was thinking how we can try and connect uh, Stefano's reflection on um, operations management and also the so-called crisis of the welfare state that's redesigning the way that we fund universities. Um, more interestingly, I would like to know how um, you think that managerial govern government governance and techniques have become legitimated within um, our society, not just in the university sector, but pretty much also in the manual division of labor, that's where it is traditionally supposed to have emerged as scientific management. Um, for example, there is historical evidence that in the US, um, the Rand Corporation, which emerged uh, just briefly after the World War II, um, established an institute of research particularly focused on um, war planning and strategic planning. Um, and this corporation is very interesting because then later in the 60s, Mac Manara brought within his administration um, researchers that had worked in strategic planning, in uh, developing game theory and economic, let's say, ideas, which were then reshaped to adapt. And he brought these kind of researchers within his institution. Um, parallelly, at the same time, in the 50s, 60s, in the US again, um, there was a proliferation of business schools and um, of, of the very discipline of management for the first time emerging as, a, as its own discipline, not just as, a, as an arm of economics or an arm of industrial or, um, let's say, technical 
sciences, but as its own discipline. To the point that I think in around the 80s, um, Kurana shows us, uh, Kurana from higher hands to higher aims and stuff, he shows us that by the 1980s, a quarter of graduates in the US were management, um, graduate schools management, coming from schools such as the Carnegie Graduate Institution and so on. So my question is, if we want to understand how today these criteria of benchmarking, quality assessment, which fundamentally restrict the kind of labor that um, teachers can do and the way that they can do it and the way that they can communicate it to students who do all kinds of disciplines, because no matter which discipline we study today, we are kind of forced to have a kind of leadership, managerial outlook. My brief question or point, let's say, would be how would you account for this graduate um, establishment of a managerial class? And to that question, I would like to add, what do you think is the role of consultancies, which, for example, in universities, as in other sectors, are fundamental in, um, in consulting, uh, investment and, and um, um, all kinds of, of, of directing funding towards different areas of both corporations and public sector. So how can we understand the role that consultancies play also in government, like Titiana raised, in also consulting how government should reorganize the public sector and basically, um, you know, reshape the, the, the welfare state? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Sorry if it was too long. Stefan. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, that, uh, I'll try to <clears throat> maybe connect that, that last question, which is such a beautiful uh, question, to the, the first question. I, I, I'm afraid I can't answer uh, all of them. But I, um, one history of the business schools, maybe even before the period that you're addressing in such an important way, <clears throat> was a long conversation about whether they should be in universities at all or whether these forms of popular knowledge, um, how to, how to uh, win friends and influence people, uh, a, a set of titles that begin in the 19th century and, and run you know, up until today's bookstores, which are so polluted with these uh, sections on, on self-help and starting your own enterprise, et cetera. And, and so I think the point that you raised in your first question is absolutely right. And if there's one place we should pay attention to that, it's in the business school in which there's always been this question of um, what kind of knowledge should be valued. Um, the business schools today as part of um, the systems that Tiziana is referring to are of course deeply caught up in uh, in a race to publish uh, what I would call pseudoscientific journal articles. Um, and that side seems to be winning in a way. And yet, of course, the first thing you hear from your students is, we don't care about this. We want to hear about somebody who's been in a business, who's going to give us the real truth of the business. And that kind of thing, you know, kind of goes back and forth in the, in the schools. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to figure out where to start with what you're raising about this um, official history, let's say, or this, this state history of, of the business schools, which you outline very well. Um, and operations management develops a lot in the RAND Corporation itself and as a species of um, military planning. So it's very apt that you bring it up. Um, Of course, we have to place it in the context of, you know, a lot of things going on in the 60s uh, in, in the United States. So, for instance, in the United States in the late 60s, um, we, we get uh, social movements around welfare. Um, and we, we get a, a, a movement inside public bureaucracies uh, that is allied 
with these welfare rights movements. Um, a movement that you can go back and see was regarded as, you know, really a threat. Um, and new public management is largely a response to this fear that, uh, that public administration would become um, activated in a certain kind of way in alliance with um, these welfare rights movements. So there were, there were all the contexts for the panic to try to, to create a professionalized business knowledge that can both be applied in these circumstances and including in the circumstances of the Vietnam War um, in the face of all these movements. But I would also say one of the interesting things is that of course, unlike the other professions, the business profession is dedicated to the dismantling of the professional class. Uh, and that's what it largely does and that's the figure of the consultant. I mean, if you think about your own workplace if you have one, when you go in one day and there's a consultant in there, I mean, what's your first thought other than shit, you know, right? You know, I, should, I, should, I shouldn't be here today, right? That consultant is literally the enactment of a kind of access to something that you thought was sealed. It's what the labor union would say, it's the opening of the whole contract. Um, and that consultant is dedicated um, through the knowledges that are produced to, to undoing um, these systems. It, there, there is some interesting literature written by a guy called Gerald Handlin on uh, the dismantling of accounting firms and professional law firms and the, the ways in which consultants were involved in, in moving away from a, you know, a professional managerial class distinction into and thrusting them into the, the, the vagaries of the market. Um, so, I mean, this history is really important to learn. I, I, I have to stress that I was just really trying to figure out how to be with my students. And so everything started for me from that position. And a lot of the explorations that I do, I believe me, I, they're incomplete, but I also take no pleasure in them. I'm just trying to get back to that classroom and figure out under these circumstances um, what we can do together. Um, and that sort of, uh, you know, leads me directly to, to the, these kinds of forces that you outlined so well in your question. Yes, thank you for all these uh, questions. I'll try to answer them together, including Manuela. Um, uh, response uh, uh, to the paper. I think I'm, I'm convinced uh, and uh, this is a conviction that has developed both as part of an intellectual community such as that which is uh, catalyzed around Euronomade, uh, again where we've done lots of work on these questions of fixed capital and organic capital but also as part of my experience of teaching uh, and also you know kind of uh, been uh, involved in uh, local social movements, you know, all, all the other things that you put in it, that there is a huge capacity uh, for autonomous organization in our society. Uh, if I were to refer uh, to work about it, uh, I'm thinking of Zeynep uh, uh, Tufekci, probably I'm mispronouncing her name. Uh, she wrote this book called Twitter and Teagas, which is about the different movements of occupations uh, uh, from Occupy Wall Street uh, uh, to Tahrir Square to Gacy Park. I've also talked to Joan Donovan from Occupy LA. And she makes this, uh, you know, she has this argument saying that the internet is really good for organizing events, but it doesn't give you the duration. So that's part of that. But another part that she talks about, she said that all her experiences of witnessing this uh, protest movement show that the whole uh, occupation movement immediately took the place of the, like, the creation of a kind of small town almost, the creation of a camp. Uh, one of the first things is she said that she found that all these different experiences did when they occupied the park, when they occupied the square, was setting up a library. Setting up a library was the first thing. Right? 
So setting up a library and then setting up all kinds of services, it's like they were replicating their capacity to autonomously produce organization of social study, all kinds of services, food services, uh, health services. Uh, so I have the feeling that the rise and rise, rise of this oppressive platform, politics and algorithms is trying to catch up and to somehow contain this capacity for self-organization. And this capacity of self-organization is not something which is opposed to machines or algorithms. Um, I think on the left we have a tendency to see uh, algorithms and technology as being exclusively instrumental and it's been about instrumental reason and it's been about the operations of power. And then there is the other position where they're just instruments, so you can turn them around. But in, you know, what's going on? These machines have so much knowledge embodied into them and they also have logic and they also have all the paradoxes of logic within them. I'm thinking about my friend Luciana Paris's work on the incomputable. When she showed me the algorithms, far from being the kind of infallible execution of a given task, are themselves machines which produce paradoxes, uh, which uh, you know, machine learning produces unpredictable uh, results. Uh, trading algorithms on the stock exchange sometimes go completely crazy. So we're not faced with a kind of infallible logical machine which is going to crush us all, but we are faced with all kinds of feedbacks and uh, you know, recursive action which can actually lead you maybe not, not so much to appropriate the machines, but also to change its logic or to kind of open up some part of it which were not uh, open before. And yes, I think there's a social study everywhere. I remain convinced that uh, it's true that there's division of labor, but I think this division of labor, I was kind of, uh, I, I found myself agreeing with the, the notion that uh, the division of labor today is not between manual and uh, intellectual, but it's between repetitive, heterodirected, and free, you know, where you have margins to kind of organize your work time, because you can be like, uh, an intellectual worker in a call center, and you find yourself uh, repeating, you know, we've been this kind of factory model repetition. You could be an adjunct worker teaching eight uh, uh, courses <laughs> a year, like I was told, and you'd be in that kind of uh, division of labor. On the other hand, you can be like a crafted artisan and enjoy, you know, more, more, more freedom. But at the same time, it's true there is an international division of labor, and there is this idea that the Silicon Valley does innovation, and other parts of the world kind of assemble pieces together. But is it still the case that uh, that kind of work absorbs the whole identity of the worker? Is it, is it the case that there's no social study, you know, when there is just uh, factory work uh, available? You know, is this something, is the division of labor something which explains uh, uh, the, the kind of social capacity to study and activate oneself? Uh, I don't think it does. I mean, I think, I, I think that, the, of course, there's a tradition in the working class movement of kind of social study. I know E.P. Thompson, you know, documented that in his study of the, Engl the making of the English working class. There's always been a tendency towards self-education and self-formation. And I, I think when we think about the post-university, we need to think how to connect to that, to connect to all the study that is going on in society. And again, it's about, the, not, not just about the humanities, uh, especially around the issue of health, I insist, you know, there's so many groups. I mean, every, you know, for, for everybody who's kind of struck with an illness or a condition, there is a group of active, of researchers who are actually kind of learning themselves through their own body uh, experiences and through connections with others, what that condition is, who are like looking at the literature. I'm thinking about uh, Salvatore Iaconesis and Oriana Persico book, The Cure, uh, where they kind of uh, did this experiment with uh, Salvatore's brain cancer when they uploaded, uh, they managed to get the, the, the kind of uh, the scan of his brain through great work and uh, kind of wrangling with the institution, uploaded on the internet and kind of did this experiment of what it means today for people to cure cancer. Cancer is a social disease. It's, it's epidemic. Everybody has some kind of uh, dealt with it, and everybody has an opinion on it. Uh, 
and, and, and this kind of division of labor between doctors uh, and patients, uh, where I have the knowledge and you just have to accept it, is increasingly pushed you know, uh, on all sides. So I think that we need to connect to that. Uh, even when it's kind of the, the, the simple form of training, like it's YouTube, uh, uh, YouTube, how to do makeup, right? How to make yourself up, you know, there's still something there. Um, that, that there's a kind of, I think that the, the effect of this kind of the shift of valorization towards knowledge as added value on everything from shoes uh, uh, to all, kind of, all kinds of services, the shift to knowledge as added value has uh, created this kind of uh, uh, proliferation of various forms of social study. This is something that we need to connect to. I think the university needs to be everywhere. Which doesn't mean that it's nowhere, you know, of course you can have more diffuse status, but the, the kind of craftsmanship that we still have, the element of apprenticeship, because, you know, to acquire a university of education is an apprenticeship as well. It's kind of, it's a long uh, process of metabolization, of absorption, of contact, of socialization. Uh, it is not something that, you know, can be just uh, uh, sacrificed uh, on the altar of kind of e-learning, uh, where it's all about, uh, you know, critical it's about filling questionnaires and kind of doing tests. Uh, that's another way in which the kind of wealth has been uh, dissipated. Thank you. Manuela? Uh, very quick about the blurring of the, um, of the uh, manual and intellectual labor. I think, um, I think we, you know, I, I, I'm not saying it's the same. And I don't think, I, but I do think definitely that it's an uneven process. And the way I try to put it in my, in, you know, and, and they have put it, is to think it in an unexpected way. So for a long time, you know, we've been defending the fact that there was still extractive labor, that there was still manual labor, that, you know, not everything became intellectual labor and so on and so on. But what we now realize is that the, it's actually going the other way, that what we considered to be intellectual labor is now being, you know, to make it very simple, proletarized. Yeah, so it's the other way around. This is one thing. The other thing is, I think, it's an uneven process. And I'll give you an example. And uh, Tiziana has been referring to it by speaking about the repetitive task uh, division, basically. So you have a, a content management center in the, in this, in the middle of Berlin. Yeah? These are people who are doing content management for Facebook, basically looking at what content needs to be taken away yeah? Most of these people are migrant labor because they usually don't need the, the language skills. Uh, they, they are usually precarious workers. And the other aspect that I think is really interesting about it is that, and what we still, what we don't know yet is that, and what came out because it was leaked documents from Facebook is that they define today what racism is. You know, they begin to give their own ideas about what it is and what and how these repetitive labor workers have to exa ex exec ex execute. Yeah? So this is one thing that I think, you know, we have to look into and this is a very uneven process and it will change a lot of, um, of, the, th of the things we have thought so far. The other thing that I find interesting, and it's just an observation that um, I add, is that um, the other day, I'm also, you know, like the logistical machine, I'm also um, attached to all these funding schemes, blah, blah, that come into my mailbox every day and tell me what calls there are and how we can apply for funding and so on and so on. And curiously, I get this call from the German Ministry of Education and and. and and science uh, that says that they are actually um, right. Um, um, they want to finance um, um, open access publication, yeah? which is really funny, but interesting as well because it means that they have realized that the public um, sector of education in Germany is producing knowledge that is then privatized and that isn't accessible to anyone anymore. So outside of the academia, most people don't even know what we are publishing because they can, can't access it anymore. Yeah? So interestingly, so, and this is a double way to finance privatization because it actually funds, it refunds and it re, 
uh, re, um, how do you say, re, uh, public, publicly funds the open access. So that's the strange situation that we find ourselves in. And then the question, that's why I raised the question of the EU's algorithm is who actually defends the rights of these, of, you know, of us that are, you know, spread around uh, the world or in a, in a space that is, uh, yeah, not regulated by the state as we know it. I just had something to that uh, um, about your two examples. Very interesting, the one about this kind of migrant labor pool, but also the fact that uh, you know Facebook is really into automation. Zuckerberg has been saying it was in Harvard a few weeks ago saying uh, there's not going to be work for anybody, everybody in the future. So we need the guaranteed basic inca income and lifelong learning. So there was his speech, uh, but also that, that this, kind, this kind of work that migrants are doing is feeding uh, deep learning machine. Uh, algorithms are doing kind of recognition. So they are teaching the algorithms how to spot racism. So that's, that's, uh, that's interesting. And also, the well, first time I heard about this open access, uh, about, you know, just to say that we never should underestimate the capacity of the enemy to change the, the table, the card on the table. So when I heard about this open access, how, you know, we should turn open access, I heard it from a publisher who said that we needed to change the model uh, so if the public was not going to pay to access paper, then it was going to be the writer who were going to have to pay to get published. So it's the, the, the person who actually writes the article who gets charged for publication. So this kind of shift again. Thank you. I think we have still a bit of time. You're a bit late, but I think it's good if we can take some other five minutes to, if there are other questions. I think we need more time to reflect. But. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. I just want to add one um, dimension to the university. So far, we've been talking about university. I, I haven't seen the whole uh, conference, so maybe this was already brought up. Uh, the university is both a site of knowledge transmission, um, pedagogy, and that sort, but also the historical function of the university for a kind of social reproduction too, of the kind of development of subjectivities that sometimes happen in the classroom, but often happen in student life itself, right? Student groups, student clubs, that's also a crucial part of the university. So I'm wondering, you know, about if, if the university is diffuse, how do we also think about some of those functions or spaces um, of the social reproduction and care of not just students, but of, of youth. Um, I'm reminded of Anne Allison's book, Precarious Japan, where she talks about the affective activism spaces um, in Japan for precarious and then therefore depressed youth to go to not quite a social center, but something along those lines that, that maybe also social centers, whether or not they have workshops, they might have music, um, theater, comedy, um, as also sites of the university uh, in a diffuse sense, and not just the kind of cognitive dimension. Stefan, I think this is especially for you, maybe? Other? Okay, so, Stefan. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if, if you've taught uh, on a wealthy American campus, you know the proliferation of uh, student services um, that exists in these campuses. Um, and it seems to me clear that the university uh, pretty much integrates uh, today all of that into a, um, a form of busyness for the students, which um, maybe is good preparation for some of the things that Manuela and Tiziana have been pointing to. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out, thinking about those kinds of institutions. Um, American business schools, the big ones, for instance, they've pretty much given up on the idea that they're going to have American students in their MBA programs. Um, they'll have a few, but you know, America's mostly broke. Americans are mostly broke. Um, they pretty much uniformly understand themselves as global. 
and they have an almost absolute complicity, I would say, with the elites of many countries around the world who have made a decision that they're not, you know, Indonesia is never going to have a global university or a first class university. Not because it's not full of talent, but because it's elites who said, you know, we're not going to pay for it. We're not going to pay for it. And it's, I mean, it's interesting that this, China's an exception to this, obviously. Um, Singapore has been an exception. But if you look around the world, most of the elites in these countries have said, we're not, we're not going to bother with a university in a conventional sense. We're, gonna, we're sending our kids, you know, to Northwestern, you know. Um, we're sending our kids to Oxford, we're sending them to Bologna, you know, and the hell with everybody else. Um, and that's the new global university. And Rutgers knows it, you know, SMU knows it. They know that they're non-national, but part of that um, non-nationality is that they're also consolidating this sort of global class of students. Um, and the question of their training and what they get and what they're being prepared for is perhaps you know, pretty significantly different from um, what most institutions of higher education are going through from <clears throat> whether they're in Nigeria or in the southern United States. Yes. Thank you for your question, Jack. It made me think, uh, of course, I think it's different for different university systems, like Italian universities are traditionally Darwinians. So, you know, if you don't make it, uh, that means you're not fit. Mm -hmm. Goodbye, right, they really don't, don't care. But uh, also thinking about the way, what's happening in, in the UK, I'm thinking about what happened at Goldsmiths after Mark uh, Fisher's uh, uh, death by suicide, uh, and the way the whole question of uh, uh, ment so-called mental illness has become so politicized. So it's become uh, the way through which the logic of the institution is questioned, and how the kind of the demands that they, they, they've been put into senior management uh, uh, around, around that uh, uh, put the senior management in a bad position, you know, in a difficult position because on the one hand they have assumed this pastoral care, on the other hand, uh, you know, their model is probably one of service, uh, which is we give you facilities uh, where you can kind of come and normalize yourself uh, while what the students are doing their own study, you know, thanks also to Mark and everything that Mark did to kind of put this uh, in center, uh, the center of, of reflection, they're politicizing uh, uh, the, 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 the kind of re reproduction of, of the university. And that would be is, is a model of common fair rather than the kind of public-private hybrid. Uh, common fair is, uh, you know, services become an occasion of, of autonomous subjectivation where new demands are being put, where the institution is questioned and not just uh, demands for, uh, you know, the, the ex exceptions to being disciplined back into the n normality. So I think that's an interesting uh, mode. So I think Judith has a, has a question? Um, yes. Functions, okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you. I thought this was um, a really important panel today and important in light of the kinds of questions we were asking previously and the new questions and the new problematics that were introduced. Um, in fact, I ended yesterday longing for your panel and then it arrived, so thank you. Um, I also um, maybe uh, briefly wanted to um, uh, go back to two remarks um, that Stefano said, one of which uh, relates to Marx's early manuscripts and the importance of a sensuous life or um, the, um, the role of the senses uh, and, and the second, which is about um, Gregor Zamza, um, our, our worker cockroach um, in Kafka's uh, Metamorphosis. And um, I'm just wondering whether we need to reread the early Marx in light of contemporary labor forms um, so that we uh, have something like a, a, a counterpoint um, in, in the notion of aliveness that was mentioned in the senses, in, um, in, in the, the, the possibility of, of living without um, 
uh, labor-induced illness uh, um, as, a, as a way of thinking beyond um, mental, mental and um, medical services to the life, the somatics, to somatics more broadly. Um, and and I, I just want to raise that because um, it seems to me that if one's really on 12 platforms in any given day or in any given week, then one is probably also developing stenosis or some problem in the neck or the low back. Or, um, or if you are a contingent laborer and you're moving from site to site without the ability to feed yourself or not making a, subsistent late, uh, a subsistence wage, one is also falling ill with anxiety. Um, and especially for contingent laborers who are also very often advanced students, um, those social services are not necessarily available. So you're not even managed by the social service paradigm. You're abandoned. You become abandoned life in some way. Um, and and the, the point about Gregor is that, you know, Stefano, I agree with you that uh, he wasn't able successfully to close that door. Uh, he was besieged by um, the, the guy from the office who seemed more like a lawyer um, and his parents and his sister. Um, at the same time, he had that really hard shell that he developed, and it was the hard shell, which is a kind of massive defense mechanism, if we can speak that way. It was that hard shell that made it impossible to get up, to move, um, although he did find his mode of movement, um, interestingly enough, in fact, s scampered up and down the, the walls and the ceiling in a kind of delightful way, which terrified everybody that strange mobility with, with the shell and with all those legs. Um, and I'm just thinking about the defensive hardness which is um, uh, formed uh, to defend against that access and the strange kind of mobility it nevertheless permits and whether um, that scampering along the wall is, is not unlike the sisters dance uh, or her stretching at the at the end of the of the story, she she's she's leaning into life. She's she's somatic heaven at the very end while he's gone, right? And it's a stark contrast. But he had his little cockroach dance briefly, and uh, <laughs> and it makes me wonder how do we how do we return to the the politics of the body and the senses um, in light of these contemporary problems of, of labor. And the only other thing I, I'll just add here is one reason I'm always nervous about the term cognitive labor is that it doesn't actually acknowledge the bodily toll that it takes. Um, I think it's a misnomer, and I think it reproduces the, f the fiction of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a distinction either between cognition and affect or cognition and body that we probably should be refusing. That's all, sorry. In, um, <clears throat> in the Caribbean, if they say you have hard ears, it means that you're refusing uh, to listen, right? So they say you have hard ears. Um, and I, I, you're right, I love the way that, <clears throat> it's not that Gregor's totally immobile, there's, he, he moves the wrong way. Uh, you know, uh, we could say he, he, you know, he jaywalks. Um, uh, Fred and I explored this a lot when we were looking at uh, Michael Brown's death, who was shot in the U.S. essentially for jaywalking with his friends. Um, he was moving the wrong way against the logistical protocols, but he also, Michael Brown, and I would maybe, perhaps we could say this of, of Gregor there, they presented a moment, a hard moment of inaccessibility, um, which proved deadly. I, f I felt in conjunction with the watermelon man that the difference, a difference started to emerge for me that, yeah, it's, you, you show me that it's more ambivalent than I took it to be, but uh, that the monstrosity um, of Gregor uh, is more fully embraced in uh, its retelling in the watermelon man. And, and that monstrosity in turn, you know, uh, for me, was it helped me raise the question of 
our monstrosity, our bodily monstrosity, our, our senses. And the more those senses are accessed by capital, but at the same time as being accessed are degraded, dematerialized, etc., the more it seems to me absolutely urgent that we have a response at that level of our already collective sensual life and not at the level of a subject reaction that tries to reconstitute ourselves after we've been accessed um, in this way through our senses. Um, and that's kind of what I was trying to, how can I, how can I start to talk to my students about that um, with all the pressures we have to reconstitute ourselves for the sale? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, about the importance of sensuous life. Uh, I think that's why I've been kind of avoiding using the term cognitive labor, although, you know, there's a modification that talks about biocognitive labor. I was attracted by the term sympathetic cooperation and social cooperation. And, uh, and lately I'm kind of uh, flirting with uh, Donna Haraway's uh, sympoiesis. I like the notion of sympoiesis, you know, maybe also because the sympoiesis had this sense of kind of, the, of touching, of like almost eating each other, you know, the, the kind of the, the life of, of the body. And the fact that it's different from autopoiesis, which is all about reproduction, but it's about also the production of variation. And you can see that at work, every time I've been able to enjoy a situation of social study, in the sense that we are talking about, uh, there's been food, <laughs> there's been uh, touching, there's been music, there's been coffee, there's been smoking, there's been drinking. So there's been all of that together. And, and all of these things are, of course, completely banned, uh, unless it's like in very structured places and, uh, and location from the, the, the kind of situation of learning uh, that we are involved with. So yeah, I agree, they're absolutely important. So I think it's, it's time to close, unless there are very urgent questions. Okay, an urgent one. Oh. No, there's a question. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, and like this is coming from a, a UK perspective, um, maybe thinking of the, the difference or something that I'm, I'm observing, you know, like children around me and things like that, of the actual shift in brain neurology um, in terms of education um, with computers in classrooms and things like that, and how you would see or frame anticipating that in line of this, this body sort of sensuality, um, and what can be done to incorporate that in this diffused classroom? Like, there's a radically different set of brains coming up and coming through, and they are going to be the next set of students within universities or in a diffused university um, that are thinking in conjunction with machines and are being, their brain plasticity is being altered by this towards something we can't quite yet anticipate. And I'm wondering where um, this notion of critique in the university could be, How we take that into this diffused university, how we, we support or um, think with that, and what this kind of almost new species might, might be like, um, and whether you had any thoughts on that. Because it's the, the other side of this, this negative healthcare, the Mark Fisher moment, maybe. Um, it's difficult to listen because we have a sort of uh, echo, so if you can. If you can summarize your question and then, sorry. <laughs> it's very difficult to hear from yeah, here. Yeah. I mean, to me, it seems like we're just about to enter into a shift, and this is coming from yeah, a UK's perspective, um, in the classroom where the students and the subjects and the bodies that are coming through that space have a whole different set of like neurological connections in conjunction with the machinery and stuff that we are using. And how do we not have a kind of like fear of that or of our redundancy as, as university or something? How do we embrace that and, and support what that might be, learn from that and, and pull on that? And whether you had any thoughts on it? It's very, very clear now, so we could hear well. Thank you. I have this, uh, sometimes I think that I, I we, 
as university professors, uh, we have this tendency to think they were always teaching the same group. So we get more and more annoyed because they're not getting it, even if we kind of done, done the same thing several times. But instead, it's not true. I mean, the variation is amazing. It's really like st students' bodies are like wine. You know, every year is different. Every, every year you see not just the neurological effect of kind of new modes of learning, but you, you feel the whole, everything that's happened in the world is kind of coming into your classroom, into your kind of your student subjectivity. Like the effect of 2008 was so, you know, after the crash was so remarkable on the atmosphere in class. So I think that uh, I embrace it. I embrace the difference, the variation that I find every year, and also the continuity of these uh, changes. Uh, and I think it's a great, it's what makes this work uh, not boring and not repetitive, in spite of everything. You know, the, the fact that you can actually, uh, you have to try to understand what is happening to the kind of neuroplastic brain. You have to try to understand how the world is coming into your classroom. And you have to experiment with uh, offline and online. I mean, it's not by chance that digital media theory is moving towards the notion of mixed reality. There's no such thing as a kind of pure uh, virtual uh, anymore. We know that there's a continuous feedback, and the feedback goes from the virtual to the real, and from the real to the virtual. So you can intervene uh, in this. I think it makes for really interesting experimental pedagogy. And it would be even better if teaching wasn't uh, such an individualized uh, uh, enterprise, you know, if it was possible really to do team teaching uh, as well and use a multiplicity of instruments and also kind of uh, work with the time rather than having this kind of fixed schedule, you know, it would be possible to have like online learning and then really intensive like one week, uh, you know, sensuous <laughs> fest <laughs> where you actually, uh, you know, have a kind of more and more to face teaching. I think there's so much space for experimentation and they will really be enclosed by this micromanaging and these kind of rigid structures which are becoming a real impediment in facing up to these challenges. I don't know if that answers your question, it's always about hearing. So I think we have to close. There will be, I think, many other questions concerning evaluation, evaluation models, uh, accountability, uh, uh, and also redefinition of the curricula, I think is quite interesting, but we can discuss it later. Now I think we need to rest. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Manuela Boyajiev, <laughs> Tiziana Terranova, and Stefano Arne, and all of you, and see you in the afternoon at 3.30. Thank you. Thank you.